Okay, I'm going to be extremely brief. I, I, I won't give you a, a detailed biographical sketch of Almik's uh, books and career because um, suffice it to say that he is uh, one of the world's leading authorities on the tiger, if not the uh, leading authority on the tiger. He's published over 20 books um, on the animal, and he considers this book, which is what his um, lecture is going to be based on, um, his magnum opus. Um, I want to say basically two or th three things about the tiger, and uh, after that it's going to be up to Valmik because his presentation is one of the most incredible I've seen. The two or three things I want to say about the tiger is um, two years ago, I saw um, tigers in the wild for the first time, and um, it is something that I think anyone who has seen that site in the wild, it would rank very high on the most memorable sites I've ever seen in their life. And um, so that's the first thing. The tiger in the wild is uh, absolutely astonishing. And that is what uh, this book seeks to be an approximation of, uh, the magnificence of the animal. The second thing is Animal Planet, uh, the television channel, uh, did a survey of um, the world's favorite animal in 72 countries. and. Um, the results were surprising. They, uh, the, the top three animals were the cat, the dog, and the tiger. But the order in which they ranked was uh, even more surprising because the tiger outscored the dog and the cat. So the tiger is um, the world's most favorite animal. And as a result, there are hundreds of books on, the, on, the, uh, on this predator. And every year, there are two or three books. And so when I decided that I wanted Valmik to do a book on the tiger for me. The, the question was, what sort of book was this going to be? He had published with the world's great publishers. He had published 21 books. He had made movies. He'd done, it seemed to me, pretty much everything that you could do about the tiger and pretty much live to tell the tale. So we decided we were going to do the Taj Mahal of tiger books. We are going to do the greatest book ever done on tigers, which, um, having said that, we didn't know quite what to do until Valmik said, look, I've been obsessing about this creature for the last 40 years. Let me do a book that chronicles the best ever writing and pictures on the tiger for the last 500 years, which is when the first recorded instance of the tiger was to be had when the Emperor Babur um, wrote about his encounter with the tiger. So that is what Tiger Fire is about, and um, that is what Valmik is going to talk about. And so without any further ado, Here's Valmik Thapar. Once uh, he's been finished, once they've finished outfitting him, um, we will have Valmik talk to us about Tiger Fire. Basically, ladies and gentlemen, what I'm going to do today is to give you a presentation on this book, and then we'll have a bunch of questions and answers. What was really happening in my life when I was doing this book was that I had a thousand books in my library which I've collected over 40 years when I first started working with tigers, but I hadn't been through them. So I had started a process of going through all the narratives of tigers and wildlife that exist from the Mughal period, and I was hoping to put something together when David came along with the idea of the tiger, and I was already into my tigers. I was already into looking at this information. In fact, We've done an earlier book together called Exotic Aliens, which is about the lion and cheetahs, which was a result of the work I was doing for this one. So it's amazing what historical information in the last 500 years can do in terms of information. I'm very proud of this one because it took the mickey out of me. It took three years of nonstop work, 12 hours a day, to find the right encounter that people had from soon after paper was invented and used in India, basically. My love affair with the tigers happened because of my love affair with Ranthambore. I went there when I was um, 23, 24 years old, and I was welcomed there by the then forest officer, Fatih Singh Rathor, the former Fatih Singh Rathor, because sadly he's no more. And this was like a home to me, but the setting was very important to me. I wasn't just looking at tigers coming from thick forests and coming out at you and trying to record them. I'm the romantic, so I looked at it within the memories of man, within how an animal had occupied what was something very historical where Akbar had laid siege to in, in 15, whatever it was, for one year to take this fort and to control central India. So this combination for me was 
absolutely mesmeric. The fort background, tigers walking around below, and it was something that held me and my interest for a long time. So these are just some pictures to give you a feel of what Ratha Mall is really. various sections and the first one is about the origins of the tiger and the evolution from a small mongoose squirrel like animal called a miasid you got a tiger which could do anything here it's attacking in an old engraving from the British period a small baby rhino while the mother watches it's actually again an engraving I'm very proud to have found it took me months to find this but it was 100 years old and done at some point 150 years old and done at some point by the British when they were in India because we have very few photographic encounters of this kind of happening. Then the power of an animal that evolved was able to take on, when necessary, elephants. Okay, when he was cornered. And that's what's remarkable about the tiger. We have a huge cult that is around the tiger. It was the vehicle of the, goddy, but the, the goddess, the vehicle of Durga, the vehicle of various devis. And uh, a remarkable amount has been written about this. I've also been very obsessed with this and I've done a little book called The Cult of the Tiger on this because there's a lot of visual information, a lot of narrative which is about the godlike feeling of the tiger. You feared and respected it and maybe it was the regenerative powers because it was supposed to be very lucky if it walked in your crop field. It gave you a good crop because it took care of the pests and there was something about it being able to defeat evil on earth and bring light to earth. Then came the Mughal paintings and the hunting and the ability of people to come on elephant back, corner the animal. I believe that during the Mughal period there were very few natural hunts. The more and more that I look at it, I believe that it was mainly staged and staged very carefully so the emperor was safe. He didn't want the attack of an animal. He didn't want to be scratched by branches or bitten by mosquitoes and leeches. And this happened in fenced off areas, sometimes nets were used, walls were made for hunting grounds which could be over 300 square kilometers. It was a mammoth operation.
I'm not selling my own book because I don't believe I'm a great writer and I haven't written the whole book. But there are some delicious pieces of writing in it from the past, from people two, three hundred years ago, what they saw, what it did to them. So whoever tries, whether it's in a library, whether it's in a bookshop, try and get your hands on it because it's a, it's a world gone by, but a very, very special world. Thank you. So Valmik will uh, take questions. Uh, please put up your hands and I'll... I think it was about um, 1980, 81, when Fatih tried to relocate the villages from Ranthambore because of the grazing, and he set up um, places outside of Ranthambore, but they retaliated and beat him up. Actually, uh, yeah, it's not exactly like that, Borin. Let me tell you the whole story. Yeah. It was 1976 to 1979 when 12 of the villages were relocated by him. He relocated the villages by making one of the village headmen his Rakhi brother, believe it or not, so that you become a part of the family. So most of the villagers who he relocated really trusted him throughout his life and he solved their problems and those who left the park never re retaliated. It was two years later that Another village, a really tough village, it's a problem for the election commission also. It's a small village called Uliana, where they steal a lot of the poll pole boats and do a lot of problems. They attacked him and nearly killed him and he had to be hospitalized for two weeks. It had nothing to do with the relocation. The relocation process that he undertook, he undertook like he was the godfather of the villages until he died. He tried to remain in that role with his temperament, which is not, he wasn't the easiest of temperament, but he did gave his time and space to the people he had re relocated. Uh, sir, I'm a student in ninth grade, but I don't really know what we should do, like the students of my generation, what we can do to conserve tigers and our beautiful wildlife. There's no one really telling us what we should do. They just say conserve tigers, conserve leopards, conserve lions. But what do we do? We're just students. It's a, I, I, I don't, I'm asked that question, I've been asked that question all my life and I don't have an answer because I'm like you asking the same question. What do I do to save tigers? Have I done anything to save tigers? What I was trying to tell the audience is that we have a very buffoonic system of governance that doesn't allow outsiders to do. They allow outsiders to come for trips so the children go into sanctuaries and national parks but when you grow up and you want to say, I want to come and work there, you're not permitted to. The systems are so rigid that they don't allow it. They have to be broken. There have to be new doors and windows created for young people to come in for consultancies or for three-year periods, for five-year tenures, like they do everywhere in the world. Till that changes, and till that process exists, it's difficult to tell you what to do. Just do what you feel like doing. When you feel like going with 20 school guys, and I did that in once in my school with my principal, I went and I wanted to get rid of a teacher who was terrible and I insisted that we wouldn't work until this teacher left. So if you have a local politician you know or someone you don't like or a, maybe a newspaper who's not doing the right thing, just walk into that office with 20 people and tell them where they are and where they stand and be tough and be firm. This is an India that's coming where if we are not tough and firm, we will lose a very special fabric that makes up this country. Uh, sir, uh, I've been uh, doing wildlife volunteering for the past two years. What you said was, has been ex exactly happening all these two years. And give us some points or some facts that we can do to be a successful wildlife conservationist in India, in the upcoming India. I don't have, I, when I left, I can only tell you my example, I can't tell you what to do. When I left Delhi when I was 23, 24, I had done very well in university. I stood first in the university doing sociology. I was a photographer, I had just started documentary film making, I was fed up of Delhi. I was lucky that I caught a train in the middle of the night, I didn't know Fatih Singh Rathor and arrived there and he welcomed me and said, let's work for Anthambore and make it and put it on the world map. I hope you find the Fatih Singhs like that. What I am suggesting is that till the forest departments and other departments in this country open their doors and windows to outsiders to take decisions and be a part of the decision making process, I can't answer questions like yours. It's very difficult because I was lucky. It was rare. So I can't tell you how to do it. I know there's Shekhar Dattatri sitting in the audience. He's very well known for the skills that he applies and he's a conservationist 
he's done films and he's done his writing, he's done education with wildlife, he's done a hundred things. So every, every region will have people like that. But it's rare, it's difficult and it's a minefield sometimes. You don't know how, it's a struggle. This is not an easy area to enter because you have to deal with governments who don't like you because they feel there's an extra set of eyes watching them and they don't want to be transparent because nobody in this country wants to be transparent who has power. Uh, see, I've been seeing for the past maybe six, seven years, uh, the government seems to be publishing some figures after some census, whatever that means. Uh, I had two questions. One, do you think what the census they are doing is a scientific way of doing it? And are the figures right because, or is it just another fudging exercise of the government? The figures are as best as they could be in the context of India today. So there is some science that has come into it, courtesy of people like Dr. Ullas Karan, who works very closely, is very tough with the government, fights the battles to make this a little more accurate than it has ever been because early on it was based on pug marks and now it's based on a variety of different criteria. But it's based on a variety of different criteria, but there are 5,000, 10,000 forest guards who participate in it. All of them are not being trained in the best way. Their training needs to be improved. So there will be some margins of error. I go with my own instinctive figure, which is roughly three, four hundred less than the government figure. But that comes from my instinct in 38 years of being with tigers, with the government that is supposed to save tigers and with everything that happens around tigers. So I would say that the present estimation of tigers that is done is as accurate as it can be and has some science in it. As part of the conservation efforts, uh, there is some evidence that fencing around the national parks could help in preserving the numbers. Uh, in Africa, in African uh, wildlife. Do you think such an approach would help boost the numbers in India, Indian national parks? Yeah, I, your question is, is right. They're actually looking at some fencing in Africa now to do with lions because the lion population right. fell so drastically from 100,000 lions to 25,000 lion, uh, lions. And a lot of people say it's because of the huge Chinese infrastructure that has come into Af uh, Africa. I, don't, I, I, think, I think it's really sad that that may have to happen in India. There will be some areas which will get fenced and there are no choices there because we are little islands left and as, if, if, you can, if they continue with the same bureaucratic system as we have today, they will build walls and fences around some areas. I know that in Ranthambor, nearly 60 kilometers of the circumference has a wall. Not that tigers can't leave it, they can jump over the wall, it's supposed to prevent grazing some areas it works, some areas it doesn't work. You have to keep the wall unbroken for it to work. But I am I'm articulating a completely different model since you mentioned this. You mentioned Africa. I believe there are lots of good models in Africa where the government, the local people, the hotels, the travel operators all work in unity. I've seen it. I've met all the players. I go to Africa every year. Sadly, our Indian government and I've shouted and screamed at every minister to have a meeting and a brainstorming with people from Africa, not to follow their example exactly, but to learn from their experiences. After all, we are all human beings who should have the humility and understanding that we grow and evolve only when we learn from everyone else around us. And so we have to have that open mind. We don't have a learning mind in the forest department. I can't persuade the Ministry of Environment with 20 years of effort with six different prime ministers and 12 different ministers of environment for us to even have one exchange with Africa. But I believe that there are ways out of walling and fencing if you are able to, to retreat and share power and decision making. The key is that, the bureaucracy to retreat and share power and decision making, not what they are doing today, in any discipline. Because it's not the politician, it's the bureaucrat which will hold up this country to ransom at one point. Because they think they are perfectly trained by institutions that are completely colonial and totally outdated. If I take you to some of the training institutes, I still haven't persuaded them to have one crisis capsule for the problems that wildlife face in India in their training program. Or half the parks or 10 or 15 of the big parks that are dealing with tourism have been shouting that give them a training course in how you manage tourism. The forest department make the rules for tourism and enforce it. They are never trained in it. But what stops them from outsourcing it? Outsource it to a bunch of youngsters. Don't deal with it. No, they want to deal with everything. So I'm afraid 
Till we change our attitude, the sad thing is that we will fence it some areas. Because there's, it's big construction, there's a lot of money in it, and people will say this sounds sensible. Someone here. I, I come from Rajasthan and uh, I was uh, working as a professor at the Institute of Development Studies, Jaipur. And I visited these villages in, in Ranthambore and also in the Bharatpur bird sanctuary. <clears throat> and what happens is that every <clears throat> few years when there's a drought, there is this struggle for, uh, between the villages and the forest department and the t and people who look, out, look out for that. And, and the search for grazing lands for water, you know, creates this, this problem. And I believe, and I have been to the Maasai people in, in Kenya, who are now demanding a you know, part of the grazing land. So there, there are also these nomadic people who, who uh, move from one region to the other. So in this uh, struggle for the commons uh, between preserving animals, how do you think we can navigate? There is one model that you make the villagers stakeholders, the hotels give them employment, make them part of the whole, uh, uh, yeah, partnership, public-public partnership and public-private. Thank you. Basically, to start off in the Masai Mara, it's very interesting. None of the area is government-controlled, really speaking. Uh, now, the actual government-controlled area is about 450 square kilometers, about 1,200 square kilometers which are privately owned, and what the Masai have done is they've they, ha they keep their grazing rights in that area, but they've moved away to allow the wildlife to come back. The reason is that you're charged 70 to 80 dollars per person to enter the Masai Mara. The collection every year is 100 million dollars from visitor tourism. The 100 million dollars is shared between the Kenyan Wildlife Service and two Masai councils that cover the Masai. And though there's a lot of corruption, I'm not denying that, but it's, it has a flow of money that is now reaching the people there. And there are more and more models of people retreating from their private lands keeping the stake, getting the money every month into their bank account from the entries of visitors. So I'm, I'm a great believer that the village should participate, should partner with how you manage, how you receive money. There are battles to be fought on this because in, there are some parks which ch ch charge an eco cess for the villages. The money is accumulated for six years and not gone to the villages as yet because of our problems with finance departments and treasuries. We have the most idiotic bureaucratic rules. Do you know that I had to find out that there were 37 tables and chairs that the money sent from the center for Project Tiger had to go through before it reached the field. So it reached the field in January when his financial year was ending in March 31st. I spent six months of my life trying to deal with the ministry to try and solve this very basic problem. Can you run and govern anything in this system? It's shocking. So I am a great one for, for what you are saying. Yes, make them stakeholders, take a chance. Ram has a question. Have a parks, have a parks board where the local naturalist, the wildlife, the tour operator, the good people from the village. I know 10 young boys in Ranthambore. There may be 100,000 people in Ranthambore. I only know 10, but at least get those 10 engaged. You know, there's a young boy who's 18 who planted 2,000 trees outside because he wanted the birds to come back, the snakes to come back the peacocks to sit on perches, the langur monkey to come on top of the tree. He's done that. Now get him involved. Give him power and decision making. Don't treat him like as if he's a nobody. Look at our attitude. Um, I have a question which is that, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. That um, I'm Mariam Ram and I've been obsessed with wildlife. Um, when we were in Africa, there was this whole question which you brought up in your talk as well that if a lioness dies, do you or do you not intervene? Now, do you think that in India the situation with the tiger is dire enough that you have to intervene and save the cubs? Or do you let the wild take care of the wild? I, I grew up in a climate where the wild takes care of the wild. And I remember having the same feelings as you with Fatih Singh when two of his forest guards said there are two cubs lying here and the mother's abandoned them, she's not around. And uh, I said, you know, why didn't you take them to zoo? He said, no, let nature take its course because we're trying to keep something in the natural world. Um, there have been five examples in Ranthambore of abandoned cubs. They were hand fed by cut meat, then goat meat, then live buffaloes, 
and they from three months became 18 month olds and uh, at 18 months they were a problem because the man was a friend but they wanted to go near man they wanted to go near the village they wanted to follow the goat so they wanted to do lots of things i'm not going into the detail because at some i live a few kilometers on the edge of the national park these two ti tigers cubs arrived right outside my home okay at night they would circle around it's a dangerous thing so believe it or not at the moment just a few months ago they were picked up and sent to siriska what's going to happen in siriska i don't know you see you can't send problem animals like this to another place which has lots of villages you can create a bigger problem there so i i would let nature take its course or have a, a huge enclosure for these animals where they are it's an educational enclosure like five square kilometers so near the park you have a drive in which deflects tourism and people look at these tigers they are looked after they don't die but they play a role you impart good information on tigers of the questions to gentlemen and the boy asked me how do you engage with saving tigers this becomes a interpretation center but you have a huge one where you keep all these orphan cubs you have to find a way out so that's what i would say um, i know your views on the lion and the cheetah that uh, they were not native to india the population wasn't uh, wasn't big enough, etc. What is your view in general or philosophy on translocation of animals? Uh, sometimes they say from one continent to another or from one region to a completely different region. Is that uh, a good idea or is it a very specific, uh, it depends on very spe specific circumstances? I, I again, to answer that question, I, I'm, I come from the old world and I'm also old now. Um, I come from the old world and I, I would hate if, you know, a, a, a Gujar villager from Ranthambore was translocated to a Maasai village. I think that the Gujar villager would have a trauma and it would be really a sad state of affairs him living there. With tigers, I believe putting myself in the head of a tiger, if I was a tiger in Ranthambore and very sadly picking on the wrong tigers, 10 of Ranthambore's tigers made their biggest sacrifice by going to Sariska. They destroyed all their big clan links and kin links. We didn't have good reproduction for the first time in two years. It took two years for all the families to adjust to the missing links. And we don't believe that's possible. We don't believe that exists. But it has a huge impact on what's left behind. Those tigers arrive in Sariska. They've never seen this place in their life. The mother hasn't walked them the paths, shown them the water holes, described the language of the forest and you expect them to function. So Siriska had problems where we, we believe there are two cubs, but they're not seen at the moment. Reproduction hasn't taken place in the last six or seven years. In Panna, uh, where we lost all the tigers because of the clear negligence of government not listening to an independent voice who said that the tigers were dying, we waited till the last tiger went for the government to say, now they're extinct. Till then they were saying they're 15. You know, wisdom, I am so angry at the ability of how much damage this bureaucracy has done to this country, okay, and to the tiger. I can give you example after example because I've had to be in Supreme Court committees. I've had to be in every committee of this government of India and it's shameful, okay. But Panna worked. We don't know the reasons because nobody's done the right behavioral thing. They picked one tiger from uh, Kanha. They picked one tiger from Pench. They picked one tiger from Bandavgarh and had one more male from somewhere else. Because the tigers came from all different places and not one Ranthambore clan, they started breeding. So Panna is restarting with from zero to 14 tigers. So to answer your question, I'm afraid the future is this. You're going to have to do translocations in some areas and now the 43rd tiger reserve has been declared, which is a place near Kota. It's the Dara sanctuary. It has no tigers. The Planning Commission has a scheme that you have to declare so many tiger reserves, so now we have no more tiger reserves to declare, so we are declaring tiger reserves without tigers, so they will be translocated. And they will sadly be taken from Rathambor again to make this final sacrifice again, so the family will. So you asked me that earlier question, both your questions have an answer, so if you have a holding area which is an educational area and you believe, as they do in Kanha, one of the tigers has been now relocated to Panna and it's supposed to have been able to hunt deer. Uh, you could try some experiments where those tigers can be taken there, but it's a complicated one. 
looking at the audience and the few familiar faces I know, if it had to be done, it should be outsourced, not done by the forest department, done by our scientists and our young people. And that we are going to fight for. That's my last mission in life, to see the first director of a park who is a non-forest officer where a cadre post temporarily is turned into a non-cadre post. I know how to do it. It's been done through this government by different people. You. Hello, sir. Uh, last year I was working on a documentary on uh, Mullapiriyar Dam, the new proposed dam. And uh, there I interviewed the ranger and he was not actually comfortable with an, giving an interview, but he was very upset that uh, the government of India is not hearing, listening to his voice, rather the politicians and a lot of other people are talking about the new dam. So what role does a, a forest ranger or people, uh, environmentalists involved in this kind of a case? Number two, if tribals are uh, like evicted from that place, how friendly are the tribals to like uh, the sensitive animals like tiger? Like do they need to be evacuated or you know, they can stay there and even poach some small animals and birds? Yes, a really complicated question. But my view first of all, the last part of it is that those who want to be resettled should voluntarily decide whether they go or they don't go. There's no such thing as a forced evacuation of anyone or forcing people to resettle anymore. The package has been increased, so it's a 10 lakh per family package, okay? You get your home and you get a resettlement space, not easy, but there are now more people wanting to leave and there's not that much money. So the planning commission is going to make a budget for that. Where, you, where they don't leave, they have to work together. So how you work together will happen when we change our mindset, when there is a really good independent non-governmental thinker with a very good government forest officer with a very good activist and a very good tribal leader all sitting together around the table and sorting out their issues, which is what we should be doing in this country in any case, which we don't do. We just do tu tu meh meh, tu tu meh meh because the bureaucrat is all powerful and thinks that he can rule, which he does most of the time. So I, I don't know, your, your, the question is, 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 is a difficult one. So what should a ranger do? If I was a ranger today, I would be very happy because the range is like being a colonel in the army. He has the control if he's a good ranger, no central government, no project tiger, no ministry can interfere with his life. He's a good controller of that range. His only problem is his DFO and to have a good relationship with his divisional forest officer, who is the brigadier. But above that, it's so, nobody will interfere. These two are a key. So Delhi and government of India has zero control on this. It's a state subject. The forest the government of India just gives its endless advice, sheets and sheets of paper that the field directors throw away in the waste paper basket normally. I'm telling you, I've seen them there. And money. These are the two roles of the central government in, in governing our forests. It's a state subject and until you declare it troubled, which has never happened since independence, you can declare an area troubled and take it over, but the central government will never do that. Good evening, sir. Uh my question is, poachers are the one killing, but actually they are paid by some VIP or a political figure to do so for the tiger skin or body parts. What happens is the poacher is arrested and he, he gets convicted of the crime. But what happens is these guys who pay him, they are they're not affected anyway. They are politically backed up by some famous person or a po politician. So what's your opinion on that? You see, normal, normally a poacher, I, I don't know many poachers who are backed by politicians and VIPs. I know lots of politicians and VIPs who poach. So there are two. Okay. So, so there are two questions there. So the normal poacher who's the poor person who goes out and poaches, Let's say he poaches a skin of any animal for 500,000 or 3,000 rupees. He sells it to a trader in the nearest town. That trader then sells it in turn to a bigger trader, bigger trader, smuggler, till it crosses Nepal and goes somewhere. Okay? That's a normal thing. Then there are VIP poachers who will find a way in, and you know lots of stories of them that have come in the paper. That's a wholly different thing. They try and get away with poaching. Both things, I, I don't believe in killing any animal for the sake of killing. I don't believe that animals should be bred to kill them. I don't believe in that whole business of income generation through animal. I think that whoever kills animals, everyone deserves the punishment. You said that poachers are convicted. Actually, only two or three, if my memory is correct, 
people who've killed tigers have been convicted since independent India for their full term. The rest are all on bail and the rest are repeating themselves here, there, everywhere because the case files are bad because forest guards and rangers have not been trained properly to put cases and write cases out because they don't take advice from law or legal counsel. So uh, this is my answer to your question. They're two separate things. I don't know too many poachers from a village who are backed by VIPs and politicians. I know VIPs and politicians who try and poach. Well, uh, all I can, uh, all that remains for me to say is to thank Valmik very much for this brilliant presentation. And, um,